Hey, AP World History students, Mrs. Hall here. Um, we are ready to do a self-edit on your uh, number four practice DBQ, five document DBQ for the 2020 AP exam. So this one we wrote, okay? So you set a timer for 45 minutes and you wrote the entire thing. Um, if you did not, what the heck? Stop this, go do it, all right? You have your exam in a little over a week. So this is the best practice you can have. We've been doing practice planning of the DBQs and going over that, which is great practice. Um, for going over documents, understanding, going over outside sourcing, contextualizations, document analysis, understanding documents. Because here's the key. If you don't understand documents, you can't write about them. That's just the key. Okay, so practicing is, the planning is really, really great. But ultimately writing it, skipping that, you're doing yourself a disservice. Especially this year because time is the enemy. Um, doing a five document DBQ in 45 minutes, including planning, um, is a lot. Okay, so what you're going to need, um, if you typed your DBQ, which I recommended, so if you've decided that you're going to type it next week um, when you take it online, um, then what I would do real quick is print it off. So stop this real quick, go print it off so you have it in front of you. I grab a pen, something you can mark it up with um, so that you can score the points or mark things as we're going through. Okay, so having a hard copy that's going to be a good thing for you to have. All right. So grab that real quick, um, get that. Also, if you wanted to, you could print off a copy of the rubrics if you wanted. I didn't make a scoring sheet for this just because might as well just have your essay and you can mark it, okay? And we're literally, we're going to add them up. So if we go through each one, I'll just say off to the side, give your kind of abbreviate what the point is and then give yourself a one, two, or three, or you know however many points it's worth and we'll add it up at the end, okay? So if I figure you're mature enough, you can do it. Or if you really want to, like I said, you could print off the rubrics and just keep score on that as we go through, okay? It's pretty much all in order except the grouping one. I, I did move that up just because it makes it easier to do some of the other ones, all right? Here we go, get ready, this is a longer one, all right? So I got my water. Yeah, prepping this slideshow took much longer because you had to go through every aspect of the, of the um, rubrics. So hopefully you'll get a lot out of this and um, we'll dive right in. Okay, the prompt was um, evaluate the, so I like this one a lot. You've noticed I've been, I've been trying to like pick the DBQs, not just um, different time frames of the DBQs, but also different locations. So picking different cultures, so it's good opportunities to review. So different time frames, but also different cultures, pulling on different contextualization, outside sources. So really pulling on that timeline information. This is where knowing your timeline, doing that timeline review is useful. If you've not been watching those Heimler history videos, you need to be watching them because knowing your stuff is going to be helpful and you will not have time in 45 minutes to just go look everything up. I'm telling you, if you wrote this, you know that, right? Okay. You were barely finishing, right? You were hustling your bustle. All right, here we go. Evaluate the extent to which China was affected by its imperial expansion under the Qing dynasty circa 1700 to 1900. So basically, um, the Qing dynasty ends in 1911. Okay. So right before World War I, in 1914 when they become a republic until communism in the mid um, 1950s going into the cold war okay so this is really an end of an era for china um this is the last dynasty remember that the qing um were not chinese led they were manchurian right from the north um so other than the mongols this is the you know two exceptions to the rule of not being chinese led dynasties um and they were kind of the last ditch effort they you know china had been really in ruins after the ming dynasty and the isolation from the mongols you know the ming trying to restore the confucius society so so we're getting into a little bit of contextualization here, but just to kind of, you know, wet the palate, get your brain flowing. Now, this map they provide you, this is not one of the documents, but this is to give you a reference. Okay, so everything in the dark gray is Qin territory. And you'll notice if you looked um, at the documents and then you look back at this map, a lot of the documents, not all of them, but a lot of the documents deal with this Mongol territory, this Kanite territory, um, this Khajur region. So right here in this kind of Tibet, this kind of jagged right. So this expansion into Central Asia, okay, and the successes or failures. So what word or word? So some of you have been messaging me, you know, how do I help with grouping? Grouping starts with the prompt. Always go back to the prompt. Now, sometimes it gives it to you don't expect it. That's rare, right? Sometimes it suggests it. It might say cause effect or, you know, rise and fall or, you know, outcome. You know, it'll give you those things. But what you'll notice is on the last one and this one, there's a key word, extent, okay, which is like a measure, okay? So it's like a barometer, you know? So evaluate the extent. So extent is, you know, how, how much is something happening? So in this case, what is happening? Expansion, right? So a What's the extent of expansion that we see of the Qing? How much are they expanding? How successful are they expanding? Are they conquering? Are they being defeated? 
Are they, do they have tributaries? Are they failing? Are they not touching anybody? So it's a fairly easy one to zero in on. And so this is why the practice DBQs have been so important. And if you haven't done them and you're struggling with grouping, guess what I'm gonna say? Go back and watch the other videos because I do this with every single prompt. And this is useful whether you're writing or not. If you can't do this, writing is going to be really hard. If you can do this, writing is going to be easier. So extent, what, are, what extent are we looking at? The expansion. So to what extent are they expanding? So think about, so what kind of groups might we come up with? Well, we'll probably see that they'll be maybe successful in conquering. Maybe they'll be defeated sometimes. Um, maybe maybe someone's thinking about rebelling. Um, you know, think about warfare. There's three possible outcomes, right? There's success, there's failure, and then maybe there's ongoing or partial success or it's slow success, you know, things like that. So these actually, this is a pretty easy one to kind of zero in on, especially with expansion that tells you it's warfare. Okay, so we're looking for each document, what kind of success or extent, we should say, of success of expansion, expansion do we see of the Qing Dynasty? Okay, so here we go. Document one, okay, this is a letter. Remember, always start with source. Again, a lot of you have been asking, grouping, grouping, how do I do this? How do I come up with it? How do I analyze documents? Start with source. I can't say it enough. Start with source. If you struggle, go back and watch the other videos. Every single one of these, I read the prompt and I go through the documents, okay? And so that's the best way to do it, whether you're doing planning or you're writing, it's all the same. All right, so the source, this is from an emperor's the letter to the Qin general, okay, following a military campaign in which the general's army was decisively defeated by Mongol forces, okay? So this is a clear defeat of, so right there it's telling you that this is a defeat. This is a letter to the Qin, the Qin um, general, and this is a defeat uh, by the Mongol forces. And it says, in the last year, um, nothing in this war has turned out painfully. I reflect on my responsibilities. So this is, you know, an emperor who has fought for the general, fought for the Qin, and clearly was defeated by the Mongols, didn't do well. Um, you know, read through this first paragraph. I confess my sins to heaven and try to atone for my crimes. The um, enemy's power has been far beyond what I have known, I, I had known or expected. So he, the first paragraph he's saying, you know, I failed, I've let you down, um, our military wasn't good enough, we made mistakes, I confess. I mean, he's accepting a lot of humiliation, I hope I'm forgiven. Like, in Chinese culture, like, that's the respectable thing to do. You see it also in Japanese culture when you fail in military campaigns, that that's what you do, okay? Now, second paragraph is important. Emphasize careful defense. Absolutely do not advance the troops rationally. Hold fast the remaining force. Basically saying, don't think about invading anymore. Like, learn my lesson. Why? Because out there, the enemy's home territory, we are at a disadvantage. Do not leave the four to five cities more than 100 miles or so before having the troops return. I mean, he's saying, we are not cowards. We are just not prepared. He's saying, we are not prepared. We are no match for the Mongols. Which, think about when we talk about the Mongols, most people are no match for the Mongols. So, when we're thinking about grouping, what extent do we see sources of big thing? We see defeated. Um, so I would do something next to this, maybe that would say, um, you know, little extent, or they were defeated, or unsuccessful expansion. Um, you know, they were defeated, unsuccessful, no expansion, and this is, you know, a confession of, you know, defeat, and then a kind of a warning, don't keep going. So document one is definitely no extent, right? You know, a failure to expand and defeat in battle. Okay, document two, look at source. Again, always start with source, okay? Jihan, member of a uh, Turkish Muslim family from Central Asia. So again, we're central, in Central Asia a lot. Letter to his brother. So this is within a family, but you'll notice it's going to be about, um, it's going to be referencing the chin. So you're looking for how, even though it doesn't mention the chin, you're like, how is it going to mention them? If we wish, um, if we follow a wish of the Chinese attempt their authority, we will end up in prison in Beijing. Our ancestors have lived under control of their state. Now, by chance, the powerful Jinjing state and their enemies has collapsed, and for the moment, no one is pressing us. So if we do not seize this opportunity to create an independent state, we shall be slaves forever. The Middle Kingdom, China, has um, now taken the Kenite. So this is later when um, the Mongols were less successful. So here's what's happening. This kingdom, if you look at the map, is on the outliers of Central Asia. So there's that buffer of, there's China, which is the Qing Dynasty, there's the Mongol regions, and then there's this. So they're even further west, okay, than the Mongols. And basically what they're saying is, there, for the moment there's been a collapse and stuff, but nobody's paying attention to us. We're far enough in Central Asia that nobody's gonna touch us. So in this moment, he's saying, I don't think we're gonna be touched. I think we're too far out of there. We should create an independent state, break off, not even dabble in what's going on. So this one's kind of interesting because they haven't been touched by it, 
but they're talking about how to avoid it, okay? So this one's kind of going to be an interesting document. You'll see when we get to grouping, this is kind of the floater document, all right? So in this one, what I would do um, is I would put next to it, you know, um, no threat yet, but they're assessing the threat. So they're, they're kind of saying, you know, we got to think about this. It's kind of like, you know, there's a fire next door at that neighbor's house and you're kind of looking at it going like, oh man, but you're trying to assess how do I keep my house from getting on fire? So they're saying, you know, we see what's happening in the Mongols region and we don't think they'll come for us, but if they do, what do we do? What do we need to do? And how do we, you know, because it, it, last line, we will resist them until um, supplies are exhausted. So they're hoping that they're far enough out that the chin, even if they wanted to invade them that they just wouldn't have a chance so I would summarize this of you know uh, further west than the Mongols um, do not feel threatened because of distance so they feel that distance is their best friend uh, as far as grouping I feel like this is kind of a um, untouched or um, threatened but uncertain a future so the extent is unsure the potential threat is there but it hasn't happened yet so they're assessing the threat so to speak that's how I would see it Document three, you gotta love the pictures. The pictures go quick, especially the source. You gotta read the source, right? It tells you what the picture is about. So clearly this is a military, so we just wanna know who's the military, who's the victor, okay? So this is a core, a chin court painter, okay? It's collaborated with an um, unidentified details. Okay, one of 17 monumental paintings commissioned by emperor of the commemorated Qing War. So this basically, this is an emperor of the Qin Dynasty who has commissioned, has paid a painter of Italian origins to paint 17 different um, monumental paintings to commemorate their different wars and expansion in Central Asia. So this is definitely a victory, right? So to what extent do we see Qin expansion? We see victory, we see warfare, we see conquering, we see, we see success, okay? So this is the first document where we see a clear success of, in their expansion and this picture is supposed to commemorate that um, you know obviously you wouldn't want to paint a picture of your defeat that wouldn't be something and you notice it says one of 17 so clearly he you know they they had quite a few successes in Central Asia and moving further um, into these nomadic regions into these nomadic kingdoms so this one I think is pretty easy to group this is a clear victory or conquering or dominant extent of their expansion right that that it can be assessed okay document four here we go we're making progress all right so um, this is the Chin military um, commander. Um, sorry, so let me start over. Sorry, had a brain fart there. Okay, um, this is a the Chin military commander of Tibet. Okay, and it's a descript description of a province. So basically, the first pa paragraph is saying back when it was a region of Tibet and it was under Mongol rule, he's saying um, it was very it was flourishing. Okay, and second paragraph is saying, you know, later on, currently, so it's saying in history, before the Qin took over, um, when it was under Mongol rule, uh, this area of Tibet was a very, you know, a nice region, sacred region, they were doing well, they were cared for, and they were a good tributary. But when the Qin took over, and then over time, now fast forward, look at the second paragraph, this region currently includes, and they give a whole bunch of things, middle of the paragraph, yet over the years, the population of the region has declined um, to take but two examples, and they go into these villages. Likewise, the tax, the tax district of Sir and others lived more than 1,000. Today, less than 300 families left, yet taxes continue to be assessed according to the old number of inhabitants. So basically what they're saying is population has declined, production has declined, families have declined, yet we're being taxed at the same rate. So we're being overtaxed, which is hurting us even more. So this isn't going to be an example of kind of tax farming, basically, where we're being overtaxed. And so over time, it's greatly hurting us. So this is an example of the extent so the extent of their expansion, this is an example of a tributary, basically, who pays taxes to the Chin. And that over time, the Chin have just decimated them. They have taken advantage of them. They have been, you know, that it has hurt these tributaries and that the Chin have economically ruined them. Um, so the extent is dominance or tributary, um, but the impact it's had, the extent of that um, expansion has really hurt them over time, whereas their former predecessors, the Mongols, actually um, did not have as great of harm on them either. So we see an example of conquering or taking over, but the impact of this is really less about the conquering and more about the long-term impact, the economic impact that being a tributary of them is very harmful to them. Okay, document five. Okay, look at source. Uh, Muslim from Central Asian city, eyewitness of Muslim revolt against Qin rule. This is an oral testimony, okay? So here we go. Once the revolt started, 
Manchu, which remember Manchurians coming from the north, um, which created the Qin Dynasty, okay, had lived in cities for hundreds of years, lost their marital spirits, and were physically weakened, so many that could not even pull up their own boughs. And the arrows did not shoot, not far, um, could not penetrate the thicket. So basically, here's what they're saying. Um, keep going. As a result, the horses could not gallop in deep snow. Muslim rebellion eventually caught. So here's basically what it's saying, okay? It's saying that a rebellion took place and that the Qin lost, not because the rebels were strong, but because the soldiers were malnourished, their equipment, you know, was not serviced, their horses were malnourished, they couldn't even, you know, trot through the snow. And so it was easy for the Muslim rebellion to have victory uh, because the the Qin military was not supplied um, in this region of Central Asia, okay? So the extent, um, I would say, is losing control or defeat. Um, it shows you how the Qin political system wasn't set up well to supply its military, right? Just because you conquer, but then you have to supply it through supply chains, through finances, through um, economics, and that's, that's lack of poor leadership and treasury, and um, they clearly were undersupplied. So when there was a rebellion, they had military there, but it's not that the Muslims were great fighters, it's that the Qin didn't even put up a fight, really, you know? It's kind of like... We, you know, those examples we've talked about in class where it's like, you know, Mike Tyson against a high schooler. It's just not even a, it's not even a competition, you know, um, and stuff. So the extent, um, I would say is losing control, defeat. And then my discussion would be, um, you know, not necessarily because, um, because they had, they saw a harder enemy, but due to their own lack of supplying their army, it was their, it was self-defeating themselves, right? Because of not supplying their own armies. And they even talk about that because they didn't care for their soldiers. And so in return, they couldn't withhold the rebellion. Okay. Let's start with the rubric. So like I said, we're going to go in order. So if you haven't already, I would maybe pull up, um, if you want to, um, I would pull up the rubrics, maybe print it off if you want, or you could just keep track on a piece of paper, or you can do it on your, um, your document if you, um, sorry, your essay if you want, whatever is going to be easiest for you, okay? So contextualization, this is worth one point, just like it was on the old rubrics, okay? So here's the quick and dirty of it. Again, your goal is to have like four or five, you know, good things, background pieces of information. So here we go. If you mentioned that they conquered the, the Ming Dynasty, so before the, the Qin, it was the Ming. So remember things leading up to the Qin Dynasty, um, so that would be the Ming Dynasty. Um, if you talk about what the goals of them were, so when we talked about the Qin Dynasty, we talked about how, remember the Ming were coming out of isolation, so if you talked about that. Um, if you talked about the Qin Dynasty, they tried to restore trade, uh, so remember they opened up the borders again, um, both the Silk Road and seaport trade, they opened up Canton, remember that was the only sea, sea port trade that they would allow. Um, they opened up the Silk Road again, they actually started to expand again, remember the Ming Dynasty, they cut off all trade, they stopped expanding, they didn't care about any of that, they were trying to restore the pure Confucianism. Um, if you mention Canton or things like that, or if you mention opening up trade routes or Silk Road or things like that, that would be great. Um, eventually, the Opium Wars are going to really force them to open up their borders, especially that. So if you mention that, that's great. Um, if you talk about specifically the isolation they had been in, right, due to, so if you just mention isolation, that can only count as one. But if you talk about the long-term isolation, you know, they cut off, oh, I guess I, I didn't type it on there, but you could have put like Zhang He, how they cut off his voyages in the 1300s. Um, they wanted to return to their pure Confucianism, you know, the building of the Forbidden City. They wanted to, so to speak, get rid of the Mongol, as I listed here below, um, return to that pure Confucianism. They practiced Confucianism. Um, every dynasty right after um, from the um, from the Han on practice Confucianism um, you could talk about the Qin's roots right that they're Manchurians from the north that they're the last dynasty um, and again that um, they are the only other non-Chinese dynasty other than the Mongols so you could that is another interesting fact that you could kind of mention but really for contextualization where you want to go with that is like what brought them about and that is the isolation of the Ming and that neglect which made them susceptible to invasion made it easier for the Manchurians to invade and then their whole goal was to try to restore the greatness of China restoring trade restoring taxes restoring the Silk Road and things and they tried to do it but it was just too little too late Okay, um, and it, like we talk about with imperialism and Europeans, they'll take advantage of that. The Opium Wars will be a big example of that. Okay, so if you have at least, you know, four or five kind of facts or things kind of building up to that, go ahead and give yourself a point. Otherwise, it's zero. Now, before we get to thesis, we got to talk about grouping because grouping is important with your thesis. Okay, so we're going to do uh, grouping first and then um, and then we will go back. So, okay. Grouping, here we go. So 
what I need you to do is we did complexity, which was the, sorry, we did complexity. We did contextualization, which was the first point. Now we're jumping down to um, the last one. And that's because it's just going to make the rest of it easier. So if you have the rubrics in front of you, go down to the last one where it says complexity. And that's the grouping point, okay? Now, all the time people are like, well, how do I do grouping? So the whole purpose of grouping is how do you, how do you show complexity in an essay? You do it through grouping. You do it through themes. If you were to just literally... Discuss document one, discuss document two, discuss document three, all the way down to straight vanilla. Okay, you know what I mean? Boom, 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 boom. No grouping, no. You're, you're so much of your essay, you're going to have a hard time with soaps. You're going to have a hard time with in-depth of discussion. You're not going to get complexity. Um, you're going to miss so many other points. So grouping sets you up to show better discussion, to show better complexity, to have better points of view, and to have better soaps, okay, by putting them into themes. Now, if you do not like what you see in the grouping here and you're just so convinced you have a better grouping, then please email it to me. Try to explain yourself and then I will um, try to look at it and see if it works. But I feel like these are the two options that work the best. Okay, so here we go. All right. So the question was, what extent do we see chin expansion or chin control in China? Okay, so I feel like this first one um, was like was probably my favorite one. And then the second one, if you're just determined to have it in two groups, then there's an option. Okay, which totally works. So here we go. Now, some of you have been, I'll be honest, like you're getting a little too literal with the names of groups. You've been like, well, I, I meant the same thing as you, but I had different names. That's okay, all right? So when I when you look at the names of the groups, unless it's given to you in the prompt, you're going to have to come up with the names of your groups, and you're probably not going to pick the same name. What we're looking for is your, is your figurative intent the same. Okay, so here's what I mean by that. Extent of chin expansion or control in China. Documents 1 and 5 show basically the same thing, which is that the chin were defeated. They had no success. So I labeled it they were defeated. You could say unsuccessful. You could say lost in warfare. You you could use a lot. You could use half a dozen different ways to say the same thing. So if you said it's something different but meant the same thing, you're okay. All right. So please don't like freak out on me. Okay. What matters is are you making the same intent? You know what I mean? The figurative intent. Okay. So your first group or one of your, those three groups. Um, I like documents one and five. So document one, we see where they were completely defeated, right? They were defeated by the Mongols. Uh, they were not able to advance. That was very clear. Document five, this is where they were controlling that city in Central Asia, as we discussed, but then lost control of it due to the ill-equipped uh, Qin military. So they had to they had to retreat. Even their horses, remember they said they, their, their, their weapons weren't supplied, the men weren't fed, their horses were so weak they couldn't even run in the snow. So they were self-defeat. So in both cases, we see defeat. We see defeat of, of chin expansion or chin control. So you could say defeat, loss in warfare, unsuccessful, any of those things would work. Okay, then we see two examples of victory or success or control. So however, again, you want to say it, as long as you're making the same point again that you're figuratively making the same point that's what matters okay so document three and four show success so document three shows success in the picture I mean it was very clear success in warfare one of 17 commissioned paintings now document four it shows success in that they are a tributary now even though the focus of the document is showing the toll of a tributary that it was and that the chin were taking advantage of them right and overtaxing them the point of the prompt is what success did they have in expansion so where the toll that they're taking, we're going to come back to that in soaps, and that'll be a really good soaps analysis, okay? But to answer the question, it is a success. The extent of their control and expansion in this once Mongol-ruled area of Tibet, of Tibetan territory, was successful, right? It's a tributary who they are taxing and unfortunately are overtaxing, but it is a success for the Chin. All right, document two. As I mentioned, we were going over the documents. Document two is that outlier document, right? So document two was kind of that... It was that letter between brothers, um, I believe the Turkish uh, Muslim brothers, right, who had seen the Chin have success in Central Asia and Mongol territory, but feel that they're far enough west that the Chin won't come for them because they're kind of outside their supply lines. So it's like we're so far out that they would be crazy to come and touch us. Now, this one's kind of hard to label. So you, I kind of did this as like undecided um, opportunity, but they haven't decided. So even though it's not written by the chin and it's not a decisive um, decision, what we see here is undecided extent, right? We don't know if the chin are going to go for it. We don't know if the chin would be successful. Now, these Turkish uh, Muslims, they're they're trying to, they're trying to they're trying to take an offensive approach to this and say, well, we see what's happening. 
It's kind of like if your neighbor's house was on fire. You don't want to just sit there and wait to see if your house gets on fire. Wouldn't you want to get the hose out and start spraying your house and, you know, do whatever you could to be proactive so your house doesn't catch on fire? That's kind of how I see this document. They see the chin as, their, you know, the potential threat, and they're trying to be offensive by saying, let's declare an empire. Let's, let's be really aggressive to kind of make them decide it's not worth it, you know? So I kind of see this as undecided opportunity or unsure opportunity, un, un, untried opportunity, unknown extent however you want to label that. All right, here is another possibility. So if you are just like, you are really, um, you really want to just keep it into two groups, then here's how it could work. Now, I would change up the labeling of it a little bit just because, again, you are now putting document two in with some other documents. So I think you have to take a little bit different approach. All right, three and four, I feel, I still think go together. So to what extent do we see? Um, we see that the Chin, what extent has their control taken? I see that they that people have fallen victim or taken a toll, right? So in document three, they have defeated people. Document four, they are overtaxing. These tributaries are being overtaxed. The population is reduced. So this is a, a harsh rule and the Chin on are relishing in it. Now, what I the theme or the tie that I see in one, two, and five is um, I see that the Chin have... Um, that all three of these documents have either broken free or have been untouched or are free of or untouched by the chin. So three and four are victims of the chin. One, two, and five have broken free or have not been touched by the chin. So that's the commonality where you could put two with one and five if you wanted to, okay? Where one and five have interaction with the chin and two doesn't, how you could bring them together is that in the case, all three no longer do the chin have control of them three and four are victim of the chin, right? They are they are tributary, they fall to the chin, okay? So that's how you could tie it together. I prefer the one above, I think it shows more analysis. Um, so in that case, if you chose the first one where you have the three groups, remember group one and two, those paragraphs would be longer and then the last one would just be really short, okay? You would just quickly discuss the document, do a soaps and that's be, that would be all you would do, okay? And then if you choose the second one with the two groups, then obviously your second paragraph would be slightly longer because you would have three documents and so you basically would have a three paragraph essay. You would have intro, body, body. Uh, remember, we are not doing conclusion because you just don't have time. All right. So if you did one of these two groupings with the same basic idea of the labels of the groups, okay, if, the, if your gist was roughly the same, then go ahead and give yourself one point. If you just really feel like you were right and um, you didn't get this, then email me and see. But this really is the direction when answering the prompt, which is extent of rule, how successful, extent is how successful were they, this answers that question, okay? All right. Going back to thesis. All right, in thesis, restatement. So remember, first part is contextualization. Last part is um, is thesis in your intro paragraph. And remember, that is no different in the new rubrics than it was in the old rubrics. So it's exactly the same, okay? So keywords you need to have. If you left these out, it is a zero. I am not playing, all right? Extent, find it, circle it. If you don't have it, wrong. China, find it. Expansion, find it. Qin Dynasty, find it. 1700 to 1900, find it. If you don't have one of those, wrong. Why don't you have it? Okay, we've been over it so many times. You got to make sure you have it. Then you need to have group fact, group fact, group fact. So whichever version of the grouping you did, you would use your group label and then you would summarize a document or the documents. Remember, no document numbers. Okay, so that's the key. So it's restate the prompt or rephrase the prompt with those keywords and then group, summarize a document. Group, summarize the document. So group, fact, group, fact. If you have three groups, then it's group, fact, group, fact, group, fact. If you only have two groups, then it's group, fact, group, fact. That's all you got to do. Okay? So it's a yes or no. You should be able to answer that one. So give yourself a one or a zero. Okay? All right. Evidence point. There are three points for this. All right? And these are grouped together if you printed out the rubric. So I will um, go through this one by one. Now, your discussion of the documents, what I'm going to rely upon is that when I went over the documents at the beginning, you notice I spent like a good 15 minutes just discussing the documents, that if you weren't kind of getting the gist, so if I went over, let's say, document two, where it was like undecided or untouched or they were kind of trying to play offensive, if that wasn't the gist of what you were describing, then you are misinterpreting the document. If document one, if you didn't see that as a clear defeat of the chin, you know, he's apologizing, he's warning off the general, don't continue any more advancement, look what I've done, then your discussion is going to be wrong. 
That is why grouping is really insightful. If you're not grouping them correctly, you're probably not discussing them correctly. That is why the planning, If when I, when I have told you guys in the video I sent out in the Remind that so many of you are not doing the planning for documents one, two, and three, or sorry, DBQs one, two, and three, that is still super useful. Writing is very useful, but planning is just as useful. If you can't do that, I don't care that you can write the essay, it's gonna be crap. I'm just gonna be straight with you, okay? I'm gonna keep it real. So if you have not done those, go back and do those. It's not too late. Do them and watch the video, okay? Because you're like, well, how do I have good document discussion? Go back and listen to my discussion of the documents. And is that leading to the right grouping? Because it's all the same. Your interpretation of the document will lead to your discussion of the document, which leads to grouping. All right, so to earn these three points, the first point is very general, okay? This is, you, I'd be shocked if you don't get this point. If you don't get this point, like, you, what the heck, all right? This, this one probably everybody got. So this one is just general discussion, all right? And it says at least two of the documents are discussed correctly. So this is just where you have a general, so when I went over those five documents, if you know that at least two of them, you're like, yeah, I, I, I generally interpret it the way Miss Hall did. Let's say the picture, like document three. You're like, yeah, it was a victory by the Qin Dynasty. They had success in their extent. Boom, there's one. Okay, now, remember, I, I've, I've been emphasizing that there's a certain length of discussion you need to have. Now, if you've decided to handwrite your essay, on the, remember, your, your discussion needs to be at least two lines. If you're typing then I want to see about a line and a half or so, all right? So if you're typing, um, about a line and a half, all right? If you're falling short of that, then you need to do a little bit more if you can, all right? Um, so I'm looking for two documents where you at least just had a good general discussion where you're hitting about a line and a half if you're typing um, using normal font, okay? Not 16 font, not 10 font. I would say like 12, 13 font. You know what I mean? Like normal size font. Okay, and that includes in document two, you know what I mean? And remember in the body paragraphs use D1, D2, D3. All right, second one. So first one is just two out of the five documents you had a general discussion. The second two points are the harder points to get. Now, this one you'll notice, it says quality. First one was general, quality of the discussion. So listen to me, two of the documents, at least two documents are connected to prompt through proper grouping and discussion of at least two lines or 1.5 or more. So this is where, again, I'm looking. How do you know you had quality of discussion? If you can't put them in proper grouping, that shows that the quality of your discussion, aka the depth of you tying it to the prompt, because that's clearly what it says in the rubrics. Well, how do you tie it to the prompt? Through proper grouping, through complexity. So this is where grouping is so much more than just a complexity point. By doing that correctly, you are setting up the quality of your discussion because you are discussing your group, okay? So let's say your group was uh, was defeat and you talked about documents one and was it five, I think? Um, so then you are specifically going down that road, which is tying to the extent, which was lack of, right? Or success, document three and four, you know? And they were, the document four, they're a tributary. Well, clearly that's a success in their expansion in Tibetan territory. Territory, okay, so what I need to see is that at least two documents were grouped correctly. Okay, now for the last point, so let me go over this one more time. So for the first point, two documents just generally discussed. Boom, okay, you had a general discussion based on my earlier review of the documents. Um, if you hand wrote it at least two lines long, if you were typing close to a line and a half, okay, using normal size font, normal, you know, parentheses, 1.25 or, you know, page settings, things like that, okay, to try to be fair. All right, second point, at least two of the documents are grouped correctly, all right, and the discussion is at least two lines long or if typed, 1.5 or longer, okay? So to get that second point, at least two of the, and they can be different documents or they can be the same ones, okay? But this time they have to be grouped correctly. If not, no. All right, the last point, this is the one where people might struggle to get, but if you, this is where if you could get really good at grouping, you are more likely to have a lot of success in the document discussion. This is where you'll rack up the points. Grouping really helps you with quality. All right, if four documents show quality of discussion, so what do I mean by that? At least four documents are connected to the prompt through proper grouping and discussion, all right? So same as before, so if you already had two that were grouped properly with discussion of at least two or more lines or 1.5, now add another two, so four total, so you can add them to the last two, so four, documents total. So that means you could mess up on one. So if there was one document that wasn't grouped correctly, okay, and I gave you the two scenarios that I felt worked best, all right, 
So that means in those two scenarios, if you chose one of those, one you could have messed up on. Maybe it was document two. I feel like the other four were pretty straightforward and clear as long as you were going down the road of extent, you know, into what level that happened, okay? And again, level of discussion needs to be at least two or, two or more lines of handwriting or 1.5 um, or more if typing, all right? And again, that's with, you know, 1.25 uh, margins and like 12 point font, you know, your normal settings. Okay, so three points total. So one point just for two documents, any out of two out of the five, generally, you met the requirement, I don't care where they were grouped, da da da. Okay, and then the last two, two for having proper grouping, and then four for having proper grouping. All right, so those I expect you, you know, to tie back again. That's why we did the grouping a little bit earlier. Okay, here we go. Evidence beyond the prompt, aka outside source. So this is two individual points, all right? So basically you're doing the same thing. It's just, did you do it successful one time? Did you do it successful a second time? So this list is long. If there's something on this list I didn't mention, um, basically it's this list, um, the contextualization list, and even longer. So I'm just going to go through them pretty quick. Again, obviously you would need to expand upon these. Um, when you're doing outside source, listen to me carefully, okay? Um, you need to be thinking about the level of like soap. So it should be two to it should be at least two lines or 1.5 lines if you're typing. So two lines if you're handwriting, 1.5 lines if you're typing, okay? There's a level of in-depth discussion that you need to give. All right, so here we go. I'm going to go through the list, and like I said, you need to look at it. Did you mention that, and then did your level of discussion of that go to at least the length that I am talking about? Because if not, then you probably didn't show enough depth. It's not enough just to mention something. You have to tie it in. To save time, because we're already at 36 minutes, I'm going to go through these pretty quickly. All right. So anything about how, and again, remember you can't double dip with contextualization. So if you didn't use one of these in contextualization, you could totally use it for outside source, but if you use it in contextualization, you can't double dip. All right, um, conquered the Ming Dynasty. So you could talk about how they conquered the Ming Dynasty. The Ming Dynasty, again, you could talk about the isolation. Zhang He, um, you know, getting rid of the Mongols, cut off trade, how they fell behind, westernization, this made them susceptible to outside invasion. Um, you could talk about how the Qin, their whole goal, the Manchurians coming from the north, their whole goal was to reopen trade, Silk Road, um, you know, to rebuild the economic relationships, restore the roads, create fair taxes, all those kind of things. They did open up Canton, you know, the one seaport, remember, um, that Europeans could come to, made Europeans really mad. And remember, oh, that's something you could talk about. I forgot to write it down here but I just thought of it, silver. Remember, silver was the one thing um, that they would accept, which triggered the opium war. So I mentioned everything else. I just forgot to mention the silver. So if you mentioned that, that's a great one that you could do, um, tying that in as well. Okay, same with contextualization if you wanted to throw that in there. Okay, you could talk about the opium wars, 1839, 1842. So how India was used for smuggling all that in. You could totally talk about that, how they fell to imperialism. Um, so the Treaty of Nanking, how they were forced to open up five, six ports, in extraterritoriality, um, they had to give up Hong Kong, um, trade rights. Um, I mean, you could talk about all those different things. Um, it started the uh, Boxer Rebellion, um, you know, all those different um, rebellions you could totally go into, okay? You could talk about the McCartney incident. Uh, before the Opium Wars, remember when the British sent Lord McCarthy to try to, remember when he showed up unannounced, remember that whole story I showed you, it's like me showing up unannounced to dinner, and he wants to see the Emperor, and he shows up in Canton when he's not supposed to, and he tells the Emperor he needs to bow to a picture of the Queen, and everybody's just like, are you kidding? He's so disrespectful, because he wants, they want a more fair trade relationship, they want more um, ports, and they want to trade silver. Of course, the Qing refuses, and then that sparks later, 40 years later. Later, the opium wars after the smuggling in of all the opium, right? Which the British were requiring silver to be traded for and smuggling it out. So we've talked about that quite a bit. Um, you could talk about the centuries of isolation, like I said, that they were in um, during the Ming Dynasty. So their goal was to try to restore Chinese culture after the Yuan, after Mongol rule. You could talk about how they practiced Confucianism. They were Manchurians from the north. They're the last Chinese-led dynasty. Um, only non-Chinese dynasty other than the Mongols. Um, you could say that they end, uh, they lasted until 1911. Um, and then after this, we saw a republic, which lasted until um, the mid-1900s, which was replaced by communism. Um, again, there there could be more, maybe that I forgot or something like that. Um, so if you thought of one um, that you're pretty sure is really good, please email it to me. I'm not trying to miss out on lists. It was just a lot today, and I'm sure I missed one or two. So if you came up with one and you're like, oh, I know this is good, 
um, email to me for sure. Like I, I'm sure even now as I'm thinking, even in silver, right? I forgot to put that on there. So if there's something I forgot, please make sure that you um, send it to me. But two points, you have to have two, right? So two of these that you discussed somewhere in there. And remember in your essay, so you discuss the document, soaps, and then you put the outside source um, after wherever you feel it fits. Obviously, you only do have to do two of these. Now, if you have time, do three. But what I would do is because time is so short. So let's say you have three, do two. And then if you have time at the end, throw another one on at the bottom of the essay. Just slap it on at the end of your last paragraph. Okay, there's no there's no docking you for that. Okay, in case you messed up on one. Um, so if you have time at the end, I would slap on another one of these if you can. All right. But remember, quality of discussion, your goal is at least two lines if handwriting or 1.5 if you're typing. Okay, soaps, here we go. This is analysis points, okay? So analysis points, AKA soaps. This is going beyond just the discussion and this is where you show insight. So what is analysis? It's the why, it's the, it's the insight. This is where you show your brains. This is where you make, you show yourselves. This and grouping are when, are the AP real. This are, these are the real AP um, points, okay? Now, to save time, because this is just, we could go on and on and on, okay? I'm going to give, this is where two points, I'm going to give you the general requirements, and then I'm going to go through my first choice, and I gave you an example of each, and then I'll mention my second choice, okay? Could you do any of these for any of these? Yes, potentially, but we've talked about that usually there is a better choice, right? Depending on the document and the source and where it's coming from, so I'm going to show you or give you an example of which, what I felt was the best choice based on the document, okay? And I've tried to write that out to give you some example or leadership on that. All right, so... So here we go, all right? This is worth two points, okay? Um, so you get one point for doing soaps at least once. And that, so that's doing speaker occasion, audience or purpose. Remember, we do not do subject. We do not do subject, okay? Subject is not analytical. Subject is basically document discussion. So don't do it, don't do it, don't do it. All right. Um, it should be longer than your discussion. So it should be two to three lines, if not, if you're typing at least 1.5 lines. So for discussion, document discussion, you know, about 1.5 lines, but if you're doing soaps, it needs to be at least 1.5 to two lines, all right? You really got to get into it, okay? Like, you just can't cut lines on this, okay? Um, and stuff. And then you get a second point for having a second soap. So I encourage you to do as many soaps as you can. Do them on four or five documents if you can, okay? Again, these are the harder things to do, but they show complexity, they show um, analysis, and these are harder to do, all right? Here are my choices. If you were close on a couple of these, then go ahead and give yourselves the points, okay? So for document one, um, I think the best choice was audience. Why? It was a letter he was writing to, and he says general of the chin, okay? So I mean, it's very clear who he's writing to. He's writing to the general of the chin military. Um, he is warning. Remember, when you're doing audience, you can't just be vague. You have to say who it is, but then why they're writing to them. So audience is almost a with audience, you're almost also giving purpose. So you'll notice my second choice is also purpose. So for document one, I like audience because it, he's writing to the general. Um, he's warning of the dangers. He's, he's trying to give military advice to this general. He's saying, you know, as another military guy, I lost. Look at my humiliation. I hope for forgiveness. Here's my piece of advice. And he does that in the whole second paragraph. So the audience is very clear who it would be. And the purpose of this audience is to help him avoid the same fate, right? And so for to, to have successful soaps in this, it's not just enough to mention who it is, but why is he writing to that general? And he's writing to warn him. So if you don't if you don't make that point, which is what the whole second paragraph is about, then you're missing it. Now, then naturally, therefore, I like my second choice to be purpose. What's the purpose of the letter? The purpose of the letter is to warn, don't invade. That's the purpose, right? He's repenting, but he he is repenting, but his purpose is to say, learn from my mistakes, don't invade. All right, document two. Um, I like occasion, okay? The occasion is this letter between these two brothers, right? And the occasion is the Mongol territory in Central Asia has been taken, and now this Turkish Muslim group is, is, is they're getting nervous, and they have to decide, should we be nervous? Should we not? Should we be offensive? Should we be defensive, okay? So I like occasion because the occasion for this correspondence is the changing of the Mongol territory, all right? And they're assessing the situation. They're assessing the situation. Now, for my second choice, I like purpose because the purpose of this conversation is the brothers proposing. So the occasion is the changing of the circumstance, aka the neighbor, the potential threat. And the purpose of his 
of his, so the occasion is what's happened for him writing the letter. And the purpose of him writing the letter is he's saying, hey, brother, we got to be offensive, right? He's saying we need to, you know, be independent now, declare ourselves, and just tell those chin basically that we ain't worth their time. And hopefully just because we're so far away, they'll just give up, okay? But I like occasion because I think he really shows, he gives a lot of detail of what's changed. And, and so therefore, here's what they should do. So I really like occasion for this document. Okay, document three, speaker. I think that it's just a really easy one. Um, and now, I, I don't necessarily take the point of view of the painter, but who commissioned it, right? Who wanted this? Who who dictated that this be painted and this was this was commissioned this painting was commissioned or paid for by the emperor of the chin now again for speaker just like audience you can't just list that you have to say why so why is he why did he want the painting so who is it and why does he want it okay so the emperor wants it it's to remind himself and others of their victory progress to visualize it to keep it fresh to keep it fresh on the brain success on um, you know i don't know about you i'm a visual learner so seeing it in front of me so this probably helps him not just reading about it remember back at this time it's not like they had video of his thing so this helped him kind of visualize to be proud of to keep it fresh on the mind um, my second choice would be audience because it's who's seeing these pictures. So maybe uh, people he's entertaining, uh, maybe foreign diplomats, foreign leaders. So it's say, look at all these things, 17. I bet I would, I, you know what I would do? I'd have a gallery or I'd have like a hallway and I would just hang them. Mrs. Hall's hallway. Ooh, I like that. Next year, I'll just put all my victories down the hallway. <laughs> Mr. Plusky would lose his mind. That would be so funny. All right. But I think that so audience could be another you know, who who is he trying to visualize these for? Okay, document four purpose. Um, I really like purpose for this one. It's it's this is the one about the tributary, the Tibetan tributary. It's showing the toll. It's saying. Over time, they used to be controlled by the Mongols. They were successful. Well, over time, look at the toll that being a tributary of the Chin has had, that they've declined, yet the taxes are still high, um, that tax farming has had, and that, that, that it's not good for them. They're not fair tributary. It's sucking them dry. It's sucking the life out of them, okay? Um, occasion is how declining they are. So I like purpose or occasion a lot for document four. Document five, um, I like occasion, okay? Um, it's to show how ill-equipped the military and political infrastructure of the whole Qin dynasty is um, and easy, how easy they are to defeat, mostly because they are not much of an enemy to defeat because of their lack of food and malnourished horses. So it's basically the point of this, the occasion of this document is to say the Qin are kind of losing it. It's not that the, the enemy is great, it's that that the army is weak, you know, and the infrastructure of the Qin is, is very weak. They have a military there, but if you can't use your sword, then you're worthless, okay? Um, my second choice might be audience, um, maybe to encourage other cities, other people in Central Asia, like, hey, you know, the Qin military here was pretty easy to overthrow. You might want to see how malnourished your guys are over there and see if you could overthrow them. So maybe audience to influence others who might have a similar circumstance or similar opportunity to rebel. Okay, so two points total here. Um, hopefully this helps you, um, and hopefully what you're looking for is that at least two of yours kind of fall in line with what I was talking about, okay? Okay, 10 points total, so you need to go through, add it up. Like I said, if you lost track, you can always rewind um, or go look at the copy of the DBQ, which is on the website, right? Okay, so 10 points total. Now, minimum you should be getting a five minimum now that's not a pat on the back minimum that's a like hair your skinny chin chin now they have not come out with what a three or four or five is going to be okay um but just based on the discussions and this and that if you're getting at least a five out of ten i would say your chances of passing are pretty good i would guess a three though if i'm a guessing person but i don't know okay my goal for you though would be a seven okay to me, I would guess that a seven would put you in the four, maybe five range. I would love to see a four, okay? So if you got a seven um, and you did this tried and true, okay? Watching this and going back and writing it is not getting a seven. Writing this, setting the timer. If you took 60 minutes and wrote this, no, you do not, you do not deserve the points you got. Getting your score is setting the timer and getting the score you get and being honest to it. That's the only way that you're going to really know it, okay? Um, email me with any questions um, or any clarity on anything or something didn't make sense. Okay, a few other random things that I just want to repeat. I've been over these before, but I just want to repeat because I am getting questions about this, so it means that people are not listening to videos and, and past things that I have posted and stuff like that, all right? Remember, the e-ticket that you will get that you will need with the code to sign in for the, the exam on the 21st, that's supposed to come out two days beforehand. You'll get it next Tuesday, the 19th, all right? Now, a bunch of you have been asking this. Okay, 
45 minutes is for planning and writing, and then they will give you five minutes to submit or upload. Okay, so if you're typing, then that five minutes should be enough time for you to copy and paste it over, or if you just type directly into their the, the browser that they give you, then that's fine. Or if you do it in a Word document, copy and paste it over, then you're then that five minutes should be fine. Those of you who are, are gonna handwrite it, okay, then I would practice, okay? I would practice, if you wrote it out, I would practice taking the picture, how are you gonna get it to, how are you gonna upload it quick enough, all right? Because five minutes can go pretty slow, all right? So um, I would maybe even try to give yourself an extra minute or two on top of that. So maybe cut yourself short so that you have six or seven minutes, all right? Because that would make me a little bit nervous. So if you're typing, five minutes should be more than enough time to upload it. But if you are writing it, handwriting it, um, I would, I would, if you can build in an extra minute or two, because that would just make me a little bit nervous. Like what if the internet's running slow? Cause think everybody's doing it at once. So things are going to be slow. The servers are gonna be slow. It's gonna happen, unfortunately. And, and right, technology always fails us when we first need it. All right, what to have? So what do I need on exam day? Well, I would have uh, notes. So if you have been taking notes on the Heimler videos, the, why would I have that? You're not gonna have time to look things up. You're not gonna have time to look in your book. You will. You don't have time. If you did this today, you'll see 45 minutes is, is a is a heck of a an undertaking to try to get this done so if you have those notes i would have them handwritten or typed out print them out though okay don't have them on your computers i mean that's worthless because you're already going to be using your computer so have them printed out copy of them there in hard copy okay so you can and why would i do that only use them if you need them for contextualization or outside source don't use them for anything else okay only if you can't come up with it if you know it then don't don't worry about it because honestly looking through those notes does waste time but if you if that's why taking the notes by topic and by section, if you see the topic, let's say, was China, you could quickly flip to that and maybe you could skim it really quick and you could pull something and find something, okay? And that's all, the only reason that I would think to have the notes there. Other than that, having anything else around you is not going to be helpful as far as notes or your book or that you're not going to have time for that, okay? Um, I would have a paper or pen um, or something that you can, again, take notes on when you look at the documents, things like that. Obviously, in your computer, your phone. Um, okay. This is a question I've been getting a lot, and this, this can be controversial, okay? And you don't have to agree with me, so I'm just going to give you my opinion. You do with it what you will. This is your exam, so you do what you want to do. Do I print the DBQ or not? Well, here's the thing. You have the option to print the DBQ, all right? Now, should you do it? That is a judgment call. Here's what I would do. I would print it, and I would do my planning and document analysis on the DBQ. Here's why. Because I would type my essay because I'm a quick typer. So if you're going to type your essay, I would want to have the documents in front of me so I'm not flipping back and forth between tabs. Do you see what I mean? Because you're going to be clicking back and forth a lot if you're typing or on two different devices, which could get really like sketchy. OK, so if you're planning on typing to me, it's a no brainer. I would print it. Now, is that going to take a minute? Yes. So what I would do is have a piece of paper and pen. And while you're waiting for it to print, start writing on a piece of paper the documents while you wait for it to print. So that means the night before, make sure your printer works. Check the ink, stuff like that. OK, now, if you're going to handwrite the essay, then no, don't print it. Don't waste the time. Start writing your essay. So have a separate sheet of paper, D1, take notes, D2, take notes. You could do it on a separate sheet of paper and then start writing and then you can just reference back because you can keep it in front of you. Here's what you want to do. You want to minimize your back and forth motion. So whether that's clicking or paper, you want to minimize it. So if I was typing, I would take a second and print it. What I would do is while I'm printing it, I would have a piece of paper next to me and I would be reading the document on the screen, taking notes. And as soon as it's printed, I would grab it. Maybe have your brother or your mother you know it's printing you stay in front of it and have them run it to you I mean I'd have I would have a whole thing set up you know what I mean and or the printer right next to you or have somebody run it to you right away have it ready to go so that you could just keep going but the big thing so that when you start typing and stuff you can have the document right in front of you and you're not flipping back and forth through tabs now if you're writing it handwriting it then I probably wouldn't. I would keep it there and then just do my planning on a separate sheet of paper so I can chicken scratch, take notes, and then I would just start writing my essay. Because you want the essay to be fairly clear. You don't want to take your notes and write your essay on the same piece of paper because when you take a picture that you're submitting it and you don't want it to look messy. Okay, you want to try to be as clear as possible. Um, okay, I feel like that answers it. If you have extra questions, um, please email me. Like I said, Wednesday is going to just be a catch-up day. What do you? If you're caught up, what do I do? 
Review outlines. Go back and review the other DBQs. You want to write another one? Go back, write one of those DBQs. I mean, you you can write one of those. You, nobody's stopping you from doing that, okay? And then I will post another DBQ, DBQ number five on Thursday. You'll write it. We'll do another self-edit on Friday. And then Monday, Tuesday next week, I think what we're going to do, I'm going to do a Google Hangout one day um, with last-minute tips. Um, you guys can ask questions. We'll just leave an open forum so people can ask live and I'll answer. Um, and so we'll just kind of organically whatever you guys need um, and then Wednesday I'll have like a 20 minute you know quick rundown video for you um, and then Thursday is the test okay if you have not been taking notes on the Heimler videos that is one extra thing I think you could do having those there um, I think is helpful only just for outside source and contextualization having anything else I think is going to take too much time so I would have those ready to go plus it's just the more content you know the better so making those notes is a way of reviewing content watching those videos is a way of reviewing so always going back and watching those I think is a great idea okay I will talk to you later and hopefully this was really helpful